be reading today from Luke 19, 28 to 44. If you want to get out your Bibles or your Bible app, um, it's a New Living Translation and it's about Jesus, His triumphant entry. After telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of His disciples. As He came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany, on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into chairs. Don't you just love that? <laughs> love that line. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognise it when God visited you. Amen. Joel. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that. Thank you, worship team. Be on the ready. You'll be back shortly. Morning, everyone. Welcome to Curate this morning. If we haven't met before, my name is Joel, and it is great to have you here on Palm Sunday as we prepare for Holy Week, as we enter Holy Week, as we... You know, we're not so much shaped by ideas as we are shaped by stories. And so as we enter the story all over again of what Jesus has done for us. We let it shape us all over again. And so welcome, welcome to seven days that should look a little bit different than the other seven days of the year that, you know, all the different weeks. It should look different for us. There should be a pause, a reflection. There should be a celebration, a remembrance. There shouldn't just be plannings for camping trips, you know, next week, but, ac but actually plannings for worshipping the Lord and entering the story all over again. We uh, actually have something to celebrate today. Uh, Gary, one of our great staff members, he leads all of the hosting, many, much of the operations, as well as our facilities here. Gary got his citizenship this year. <laughs> Gary up here, the front. We love you, Gary. Congratulations. Bless you. It's very, very good. Palm Sunday. Jesus' triumphal entry. I don't know if, you've, uh, if you can imagine it. It might be a bit hard to imagine. I guess we, we visited Israel in 2018, I think it is, and so there's at least some imagination for the typography that, Jesus probably walked on as this 
Uh, triumphal entry happened. He, he was probably coming down quite sort of dusty, rocky tracks, if you would, as he, you sort of have to, dis, even though Jerusalem's a high place, you sort of, it's surrounded by mountains that are lower than it. So there's always a descent before an ascent into the city. And so there was probably a stumbling cult a stumbling donkey, it wouldn't have been a fast ride, but quite a slow, sort of narrow track being ridden by Jesus here. And, and, and I guess it, this, the Scripture screams of, of other triumphal entries. And, and certainly if you've watched a fair amount of movies as I have, it probably doesn't take long to maybe think of one in your mind where a king rides into a city that they've just taken. Right, you, you can think of the celebration, you can think they've just conquered or maybe they've returned back to their capital city after conquering a city and as the king leads all the armies back home, there's a sense of the city gates are open, the trumpets are blowing, the confetti's in the air, everybody's stopped what they're doing in the markets for a moment and they've sort of descended on the main alley or on the main street and they line it as the the king and all the triumphant armies into the city. Can you imagine it? This is how things are done, if you would. This is how things were done. Perhaps it's no different than, uh, you know, going back to the end of World War II and when all of the soldiers would return home, whether that be to New Zealand or to the US or to the UK, even though there's a sense of mourning at the incredible cost of life, there was a great sense of celebration and triumph that we've won, right? And so the confetti and the party, this is the imagery, this is, this is what the Scripture's wanting us to think, except Jesus is a really funny kind of king. Instead of the great stallion with all of the sort of pomp and trumpets, there's a borrowed donkey. There's a borrowed donkey. There's a few blankets thrown over the top. There's Jesus sitting not riding these paved streets as he enters the city, but coming in the back tracks. He's not some great front news, you know, publication today is the triumphal entry. It's you either know or you don't know. And there's no paved streets, but there are garments laid down, mainly from peasants, and paupers, people who didn't have much, they took what they did have and they put it under the feet of Jesus and under the colt who give some sort of red carpet welcome to the king, even though he is a funny type of king entering the city. And in Palm Sunday, we learn some things about worship. And, and I think this is where I really want us to begin our conversation. We learn some things about worship. We learn that worship is both laying something down and shouting something out. This is what the Scriptures tell us, that they worship Him, casting their garments on the ground and with shouts and singing, singing, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Worship is both laying something down and lifting something up. We've just supposedly done some worship here this morning. Did you lay anything down? Did you lift anything up? To lay a garment down, as I've already probably alluded to, was no small thing. To, to take, it's not like they went home to a full wardrobe those were not the times. Even the wealthy didn't have large wardrobes. Garments were precious. They were cared for. If you were rich, you might have two changes of clothes. Yet they took what is often their most expensive garments, most likely, their outer garments. Don't worry, we're not gonna ask anyone to take their clothes off today to worship the Lord. We're not going to get all David on it. But they, they took what was valuable to them. 
The garments not only were something that was valuable, their garments were status symbols. You could tell somebody standing in society by what they wore. It's not too different to today in certain circles. By the label, so to speak. To them, by the fabric and the craftsmanship. Something about the garment. We know this about Jesus' garment. It spoke of his rabbi status. He takes it off to wash his disciples' feet. Here, people take off not only what is valuable, but they take off what gives them a sense of identity and place and standing in the world, and they put it at Jesus' feet. Was it needed? No. Because that but worship's never about what's needed. Was it required for the donkey to walk cleanly along the track? Absolutely not. It may have even hindered it. But often in worship, we ask pragmatic questions like that. What is it needed? Is my offering needed? Is my song make a difference? Will it even matter to anybody? Here, people did not consider any of that. In revelation of the funny-looking king entering their city, they took off what was valuable. They took off what gave them status. They took off what made them look impressive to others. They took off all of their sort of identity indicators, if you would, and they lay them on a dusty road for hooves to dig into and tear and rip, hence their revelation of who Jesus was coming into the city. So I ask again today as we went through a time of worship, have you laid anything down? Have you laid down anything to the Lord in any recent time of worth to you? Have you laid down anything that when you would leave this place, you would have less in one sense, but so much more in another because you put it under the feet of Jesus? Has there been any actual sacrifice to your worship where you might not have something to take home that you brought in because you left it at the feet of Jesus? When was the last time you laid something down? Because this is the heart of worship. This is the heart of worship. Not pragmatic, not needed, not even asked for by Jesus, but such a response in light of the coming King, what do these clothes even matter? In light of the coming King, what do my resources even matter? In light of the coming king, what do all of these things that I cling to to give me a sense of place and control and stature in the world, what do they even matter in light of the coming king? This is the heart of worship. And they don't just lay something down, they lift something up. They lift up their voice. how dangerous it was for them to lift up their voice. When they lifted up their voice, <laughs> anytime worship rises, an anti-worship spirit will also rise with it. This always happens. This is like, this is David. He dances before the Lord and he only to get home to find his wife judging him, condemning him, that he would be so undignified to worship the Lord in that way. Every time worship rises, an anti-worship sort of spirit arises. It's no different in the church. How ridiculous are those people? Look how passionate they are. Who are they trying to impress? What do they think they're doing on their knees or shouting or lift their hands or interrupting me? How dare they? And so there's a cost to their worship as they lifted up their words because they know they lifted them up in the hearing of the Roman Empire to say one is coming in, in, in the, in, you know, the, this is, he's coming in the name of the king is to say that guy on the throne really isn't the king. But they lift up their voice anyway. They lift up their voice knowing that actually really there was two controlling entities in this time. There was the Roman entity and there was also the religious entity, the religious system. And they lift up their voice knowing that they may be shunned from the synagogues, refused to be traded with, no longer to do business, cast out because to claim him as the king is to be blasphemous. 
And so they lift up their shouts and their songs. I don't know why. I don't suppose to know why. I find it quite funny. I find it amusing, but I find it things too great for me to understand. I don't know why God has this obsession with us lifting our voice to him. I don't know why he has this obsession of us lifting our hands to him. I don't know why he wants us to embody our worship in song. I, I get our whole lives of worship. I get that. that that's, that's Romans 12. Offer your whole selves as a living sacrifice. I get that our whole lives are worship, but I don't get why so many of these pages of the scripture talk about singing and shouting and dancing and lifting up their hands. And look, to be honest, I don't need to know why. Because such is the reverence for Christ that if he says it, that's good enough for me. I could suppose some reasons why. I could suppose because from the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. And so our song gets an opportunity to locate us. I, I could suppose, I guess, that we are embodied creatures and as neuroscience has proved, it's easier to smile your way into feeling happy than it is to feel your way into a smile. You get what I'm saying? That actually the body can lead other parts of our being. And so I guess maybe I get why he would say to sing. We know that James says that actually the tongue is like a rudder for our lives. Though small, it can steer a great ship. Or like a tiny bit in the mouth of a horse that even just the slight pull on it can turn the direction of even the strongest source. I guess maybe I get why. I don't pretend to get all of it, but I need to remind us today it's not just important in worship to lay things down to our Lord that we need to lift things up. And yeah, it's weird. We can acknowledge that. And yeah, why didn't he give us all a good singing voice if he wanted us all to sing and shout? As the person with the worst singing voice in this room, I'm all too familiar with that. Why, Lord? Well, oh, it's not about you, Joel. They lift it up. And we learn when, they, when the religious sort of anti-worship of Jesus' spirit comes and says, why are you letting these people worship you like this, Jesus? And Jesus says, look, if they didn't, even the rocks would cry out. <laughs> I got a bucket of rocks that I brought back from Israel here. All of these rocks featured in all the biblical stories. That's what the person selling them to me told me. There's a worship that the Lord is so deserving of and that we were destined to bring that if we don't bring it, the Lord is so worthy of it that those that were never designed to take the place of worship, the worship is so overdue, they will rise up and take it if you don't give the Lord what is due. That is what Jesus is saying here is that I am so worthy of worship, Jesus says, that what you don't understand is that if humanity wouldn't rise up, creation would rise up and even the dumb, stupid rocks, the least worshipful of all of the creatures, I get the trees worshipping, I get the stars worshipping, I get the rivers worshipping, they got some movement to them, but even the dumb, stupid rocks would cry out and worship, that's how worthy I am. And I get that you don't get it, Jesus says, but even the rocks would cry out. 
And so worship is not just laying down, but lifting up. Worship is also because the Lord has been doing good things and He deserves to be praised for them. He deserves to be praised for them. This rock, this rock was in the desert. Moses came along with a thirsty people. I promise you, it's the real one. <laughs> this rock, if you don't cry out, this rock could tell you a story of in a dry, barren place been struck by a stick of faith. And this rock couldn't believe it. Water started gushing out of it. He didn't know what was happening. He didn't even know there was water inside of him. But he can testify that the Lord can bring water in dry places. He has, he does, and he will. I got more. I just started thinking of all the times rocks could praise the Lord. This one, once again, it's really from the walls of Jericho. I know it looks similar to the other one. That's because they're stored in the same place. Man, if this rock could tell a story, it would probably start with a story of trembling. Man, we could see the armies coming. We heard rumors of them across the Jordan River and that we were in their land, the land that the Lord had for them. And I was with all my buddies, packed tightly in this wall and we thought that that was good enough. But then these crazy people started walking around us. Day one, they walked around, we shook a little. Day two, they walked around, we shook some more. Day three, day four, day five, day six. And then on day seven, they didn't just walk once. They walked seven times. And then they, somebody blew a ram's horn. And then they started shouting. And I don't know what started happening to me, but it's like the power of God entered me and all my friends and we started shaking loose and we shook and we shook and we shook until we came crumbling down because we couldn't stay in the way of what the Lord had destined to take place. <laughs> Even the rocks could cry out. the little one. I was sitting there with four of my buddies in the river. Man, we rolled and rolled and rolled from up in the mountains all the way down into the valleys and I was just minding my own business. And one day a hand came through the water they grabbed me and my buddies and then they put us in a dark place. I thought, finally, I'm getting ready to be used for something mighty. I saw the light for a moment. It smelt like leather. I found myself in a dark place, but then all of a sudden, in the midst of a battle, a hand of faith reached out and grabbed me put me in a sling. I've never been moved so fast. I spun, I spun, I spun. I didn't know which way was up and which way was down. And then, whew. And I took down that mighty blasphemer against the Lord. And the Lord used me in the most unlikely victory to take a shepherd boy to defeat a giant. Oh, I could tell you about what God could do. I was just minding my own business one day when I heard a whole bunch of shouts to crucify him. I 
I was sitting there, I don't know if I was in the right spot or not, but they jammed a giant wooden cross right on top of me. I could hear them saying, who do you think you are? Save yourself. If you truly are the son of God, come down from there. One of my buddies a little bit to my left, he had a cross on him too. And one to my right, one of them cried out, would you save me? Today you'll be with me in paradise, I heard the man on top of me say. And then as he breathed his last, I saw something I'd never seen before. I've had many crosses sit on top of me, but I've never seen the earth shake and the sky go dark. And I've never heard the Roman soldiers say, surely this was the Son of God. Even the rocks could cry out, eh? I was so stoked about that time that I got carved into a giant stone to seal the tomb of a wealthy man. I heard one day him and his whole family were going to get buried there and I was just, I was stoked just not to be an ordinary stone but to be a stone that got to at least be moved a couple of times in my life. They carved me into a giant circle. And then they put another man in that tomb. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting to be used so soon. I thought I had a few years left yet before I'd be put in my final resting place. But it wasn't to be. It was late at night. They placed me in that tomb they rolled me over it, they sealed it, and I thought, this is where I will lay for some very long time. I'd only had two sleeps. And I don't know what was happening, but we were on the move. The angels had appeared, we were rolling, and the King of Glory emerged, and I had no idea who I was sealing in. There is a part of worship, and that the worship team can come and join me. There is a part of worship that is about retelling and retelling and retelling and retelling about all of the times God has been faithful. Every miracle, every story, every moment, this is part of it. This is, this is what the story tells us in Luke 19, that because of all Jesus had done and all of the miracles, they worshipped him. They laid things down and they lifted things up because of all He had done. And if they weren't going to do it, the rocks would rise up and tell you about all the things Jesus had done because Jesus was there in every single one of these stories. And I know that in this room, there is not just these stories to shape our faith. You got your own stories of all the things God has done. Every peculiar miracle that you've been tempted to discount as just good fortune. Every direct miracle every sustaining grace that has got you to this point of your life and you haven't given up the faith yet. There's a part of worship that is about looking back 
and going, God deserves so much praise. And we all get that. I think we can understand that. I think we can agree. I think we could rise up just with the stories we've been reminded of today. It's enough to rise up and be like, all hail King Jesus. It's enough. But worship isn't only about the past. It's prophetic and about the future. They welcomed the King as He rode into the city, the funny type of King that was Jesus. They worshipped Him, but they didn't understand it all and they didn't need to, to worship Him. They worshipped Him before He was triumphant. They worshipped Him before He conquered sin and death. They worshipped Him before the stone was rolled away and it began to make sense. They worshipped Him before the Spirit was poured out and they worshipped Him before He returns with all of His angels to judge the world and lead us into the fullness of life that is eternal. They worshipped and before. They didn't get it all. They didn't understand it all, but they worshipped nonetheless. And I know if I was gonna if I was gonna call this message something, I would have called it I know a secret. <laughs> I know a secret. <laughs> I know a secret. Because I know that whatever is going on in your life, it'll turn out for good. I know that whatever battle you face, that the Lord will show Himself to be victorious in it. I know that the Lord loves you and that He has your best interests at heart. I know that He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I know He is coming back. And so I know a secret and so I'm happy to join with the rocks, although I'd, lead, I'd like them to not need to worship on my watch. I'm gonna take that place. You guys can be quiet, rocks. I got it. You're not needed. It wasn't your calling, but it is mine. So I'll take my post as a worshiper and I'll be found laying some things down and some lifting some things up. But I don't just worship because of what God's done. Every time I worship, it's a prophetic act of defiance to not succumb to fear, to not succumb to unbelief, to not succumb to abandoning your post, to not succumb to the enemy's agenda in your life. Every time you worship, it is a prophetic act. And I wanna tell you that it's a lot easier to worship because of what God has done than it is to worship prophetically for what He's yet to do. It's so much harder to worship prophetically, but it is worship nonetheless. And it, does, it, it, it still requires us to lay things down, even though it's terrifying and to lift things up. And so church, if you're willing and able, on Palm Sunday, let's begin to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord with all of our heart, our might, our strength, our song. Let's get some room in here. If you need some room, come to the front. If you need some room, get in an aisle. If you need some room, head to the back. Uh, Mark, would you come and take these things, please? And I have a strong sense today that as we come into His presence once again in worship, that He will meet us there.